Hi everyone and welcome to the first part of Capablanca's Chess Fundamentals. We begin with a quote, Do or do not, there is no try, from Master Yoda. Now Chess Fundamentals by Jose Raul Capablanca is another classic chess book written over 100 years ago. Regarded by Mikhail Botvinnik, the Soviet chess grandmaster and sixth world chess champion as the best chess book ever written, recommended by many as a must read for all chess players, beginners to grandmaster. After Nemzovich's My System, this will be the second major project for my YouTube chess channel. The aim once again is to go through the book myself and make it available for interested viewers in a comprehensive video format. And now some words on Capablanca. Jose Raul Capablanca was a Cuban chess player and was world chess champion from 1921 to 1927. He was a chess prodigy who is renowned for his exceptional endgame skill and speed of play. He was born to Spanish parents in Havana, 1888. His father was an army officer and according to Capa, he learned to play chess at the age of four, watching his father play with friends, pointed out an illegal move and then beat his father in the game. At the age of 13, he beat Juan Corzo, the Cuban chess champion, in a match. His strength and skill in the game grew rapidly, and his early adult career was marked by an overwhelming win in a match against Frank James Marshall, and a first place in the prestigious San Sebastian tournament of 1911. Capablanca became world chess champion in 1921 after defeating Emmanuel Lasker in a formal match. However, Lasker had already resigned the title to Capa in 1920, stating, You have earned the title not by the formality of challenge, but by a brilliant mastery. In 1927, before the New York chess tournament, Capablanca wrote that he had more experience but less power than in 1911, that he had peaked around 1919, meanwhile some of his opponents had become stronger, yet he was in fine form and went on to win the New York chess tournament that year, finishing undefeated in it. However, shortly afterwards the same year, he lost the World Chess Champion title to Alexander Alekhine. This came as a surprise to the entire chess world since Kappa had been the favourite to win the event. Much has been debated regarding Kappa's loss to Alekhine, yet it would seem an important factor was the lack of preparation, both physical and technical on Kappa's part, whereas Alekhine had thoroughly studied Capablanca's play and had gotten into good physical condition before the match. After the World Championship match, Kappa continued to find success in chess. However, in early 1930s, his play started showing signs of decline. His speed of play had slowed as compared to his days of youth, and he would get in occasional time trouble. Kappa excelled in simple positions and endgames, and his positional judgment was outstanding. So much so that most attempts to attack him came to grief without any apparent defensive efforts on his part. But he could play great tactical chess when necessary. Bobby Fischer, who was world chess champion from 1972 to 1975, admired his light touch and ability to see the right move very quickly. Capablanca's style influenced world champions Fischer, Karpov, and Botvinnik. Even Alekhin received schooling from him in positional play before their fight for the world title made them bitter towards each other. 
As a chess writer, Kappa would not give large amount of detailed analysis, instead focusing on critical moments in the game. His writing style was plain and easy. Kappa had a liking for baseball, which he described as not a difficult game to learn and it is an enjoyable game to play. His second wife, Olga, thought he resented that chess had dominated his life and wished he could have studied music or medicine. Now, let's take a few minutes to go through a miniature game played by Capablanca. And the game I chose was a casual one played in New York, USA 1918, around the time when Kappa was playing at the peak of his strength. His opponent with the black pieces was Mark Fonarov, a Russian-born violinist and teacher. Kappa began with e4 and Fonarov responded e5. Knight f3, knight c6. And with d4, we have the scotch game, which however later transposes. Play continued with d6, knight c3, knight f6, bishop e5, bishop d7. Castles, and with bishop e7, we now have the hedgehog variation of the Lopez Berlin defense. Rook e1 by Kappa, developing the king's rook over to the semi-open e file, and Fonarov here took on d4. White recaptured with knight takes on d4, and now a couple of minor pieces are traded. Knight takes on d4, queen takes on d4, bishop takes b5, and knight takes b5. Castles by black and queen c3 by kappa threatening to win the c7 pawn. Fonarov parried with c6. So knight d4 by white where the knight aims to get to f5. Fonarov played knight d7 which is a mistake and better was rook e8 instead with the idea after knight f5 to preserve the dark bishop by playing bishop f8. After knight d7 though, knight f5 comes with even more strength, putting pressure on black's entire king side. Black played bishop f6, attacking the queen. But now queen g3 by kappa, finding the strongest move in the position. The queen is well placed here, putting pressure on both g7 and d6. Knight e5 and bishop f4 by white, developing the last minor piece and connecting the rooks. Fonarov followed suit and connected rooks as well by queen c7, rook d1 and rook d8. White is not only better developed here but also enjoys the benefits of space and more attacking pieces. Black on the other hand is yet to develop the king's rook and must defend accurately against white's attacks. Kappa played rook takes on d6 here, which according to Stockfish is inaccurate since black equalizes after rook takes on d6, bishop takes on e5, and queen a5. A sample line with accurate play would run bishop c3, bishop takes on c3, b takes on c3, rook g6. And now white wins the exchange back by knight e7 check with an equal position. Fonarov, however, blundered after rook takes on d6, bishop takes on e5 and played rook d1, 
which gives a decisive advantage to white and kappa found the best series of moves starting by rook takes on d1 bishop takes on e5 knight h6 check and king h8 all right you can pause the video here to find the best move for white Queen takes on e5, sacrificing the queen. Queen takes on e5, but now knight takes on f7 check, where Fonarov resigned. Since rook takes on f7 fails to rook d8 check, exploiting black's weak back rank. Whereas after king g8, White will simply be up a piece and two pawns with a winning position. Capablanca withdrew from serious chess from 1931 for several years, but did make a comeback to it in 1934. Towards the end of his career, he was diagnosed with high blood pressure. He passed away due to a stroke in 1942. Alexander Alekhine wrote in a tribute to him, Capablanca was snatched from the chess world much too soon. With his death, we have lost a very great genius whose like we shall never see again. Emmanuel Lasker once said, I have known many chess players, but only one chess genius, Capablanca. And now we move towards the book, starting off with the preface where it's written. Chess Fundamentals was first published 13 years ago. Since then, there have appeared, a diff there have appeared at different times a number of articles dealing with the so-called hypermodern theory. Those who have read the articles may well have thought that something new of vital importance had been discovered. The fact is that the hypermodern theory is merely the application during the opening stages generally of the same old principles through the medium of somewhat new tactics. There has been no change in the fundamentals. The change has been only a change of form and not always for the best or that. In chess, the tactics may change, but the strategic fundamental principles are always the same. So that chess fundamentals is as good now as it was 13 years ago. It will be as good a hundred years from now, as long in fact, as the laws and rules of the game remain, this, remain what they are at present. The reader may therefore go over the contents of the book with the assurance that there is in it everything they need and that there is nothing to be added and nothing to be changed. Chess Fundamentals was the one standard work of its kind 13 years ago and the author firmly believes that it is the one standard work of its kind now. Jose Raul Capablanca, New York, September 1st, 1934 Moving towards the contents section of the book, where we find that it is divided into two parts. The first part has six chapters, whereas the second part is a collection of 14 illustrative games annotated by Capablanca himself. So now we move towards the first part of the book, starting with chapter 1, which is called First Principles, Endings, middle game and openings. Capablanca writes, The first thing a student should do is to familiarize themselves with the power of the pieces. This can best be done by learning how to accomplish quickly some of the simple mates. Number one, some simple mates. Example one, the ending rook and king against king. The principle is to drive the opposing king to the last line 
on any side of the board. In this position, the power of the rook is demonstrated by the first move, rook a7, which immediately confines the black king to the last track, and the mate is quickly accomplished by king g8 and king g2. The combined action of king and rook is needed to arrive at a position in which mate can be forced. The general principle for a beginner to follow is to keep their king as much as possible on the same rack or as in this case pal as the opposing king. When in this case the king has been brought to the sixth rack, it is better to place it not on the same file but the one next to it towards the center. King f8, king f3, king e8, king e4, king d8, king d5, king c8, and king d6. Not king c6 because then black will go back to d8 and it will take much longer to mate. So king d6 and if now the king moves back to d8 Rook a8 mates at once. As such, king b8. Rook c7. King a8. King c6. King b8. King b6. King a8 and rook c8 mate. It has taken exactly 10 moves to mate from the original position. On move 5 here, black could have played king e8. And according to the principle, white would have continued king d6 and king f8. The black king will ultimately be forced to move in front of the white king and be mated by rook a8. King e6, king g8, king f6, king h8, king g6, king g8 and rook a8 mate. Example 2. Since the black king is in the center of the board, the best way to proceed is to advance your own king. Thus, king e2, king e5, and king e3. As the rook has not yet come into play, it is better to advance the king straight into the center of the board not in front but to one side of the other king. Should now the black king move to e5, the rook drives it back by rook h5 check. On the other hand, if king c4 instead, then also rook h5. If now king b4, there follows king d3. But if instead king c3, then rook h4. Keeping the king confined to as few squares as possible. Now the ending may continue, king c2, rook c4 check, king b3, 
king b3 king b2 rook b4 check king a3 king c3 and king a2 it should be noticed how often the white king has moved next to the rook not only to defend it but also to reduce the mobility of the opposing king now white mates in three moves thus rook a4 check king b1 rook any safe square on the a file forcing the black king in front of the white king c1 and rook a1 mate it has taken 11 moves to mate and under any conditions i believe it should be done in under 20 white while it may be monotonous it is worthwhile for the beginner to practice such things as it will teach them the proper handling of their pieces example 3 now we come to two bishops and king against king Since the black king is in the corner white can play bishop d3 king g7 bishop g5 king f7 bishop f5 and already the black king is confined to a few squares if the black king in the original position had been in the center of the board or away from the last row white should have advanced their king and then with the aid of their bishops restricted the black king's movement to as few squares as possible we might now continue king g7 and king f2 in this ending the black king must not only be driven to the edge of the board but he must also be forced in a corner and before a mate can be given the white king must be brought to the sixth rank and at the same time in one of the last two fouls in this case either h6 g6 f7 or f8 and as h6 and g6 are the nearest squares it is to either of these squares that the king ought to go as such king f7 king g3 king g7 king h4 king f7 king h5 king g7 bishop g6 king g8 king h6 and king f8 white must now mark time and move one of the bishops so as to force the black king to go back bishop h5 king g8 bishop e7 and king h8 Now the light squared bishop must take up a position from which it can give check next move along the light diagonal when the black king moves back to g8 bishop g4 king g8 bishop e6 check king h8 and bishop f6 mate It has taken 14 moves to force the mate and in any position it should be done in under 30 In all endings of this kind care must be taken not to drift into a stalemate In this particular ending one should remember that the king must not only be driven to the edge of the board but also into a corner 
In all such endings, however, it is immaterial whether the king is forced to the last rank or to an outside foul, for example, h5 or a4, e1 or d8. All right, we conclude this part of Capablanca's chess fundamentals here and we shall continue onwards from the next one. Here is a look at the recent channel support from my Twitch stream. Several new supporters including Otho Magic, Nikes42, Become Resolute, Ahmed11, Monkey Man, Crouchy IOM, Raising Arizona, The Hell R, Goiju, Purian 113, Lootstick, Lufo, Puck 300, Brig Skeet, DGN Army, Originator, Caesar Libre, and No Friction. Thank you for the kind support everyone, much appreciated. Alright, until next time, take care.